nothing. And if we can grasp that, that will change our perspective or our mindset about the things that we're borrowing. So when we get to verse number five of Hebrews chapter 13, now that we're starting to lay out the, the thought or the mindset of God, when God is conveying this, he's letting people know, look, don't fall in love with something that don't belong to you. Never mind. Keep your life free from money. Or wait, better yet, keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave, which is the thought of separate. And nor forsake you, which is the thought of abandoning. Oh, how layered is this one verse? Putting money in the right perspective first starts with the understanding that nothing belongs to us. The job that we have doesn't belong to us. The car that we have doesn't belong to us. The clothes on our backs don't belong to us. The shoes on our feet do not belong to us. The home that we live in does not belong to us. We are merely managers of the provisions from God. We can appreciate that when we think of our kids. I remember when uh, me and my brother got enough gall to close the door and lock it to where my dad had to knock for entrance. Okay. Let me just fast forward this. We came home the next day, walked straight into the room because there was no door there. No door. He, we had to be quickly reminded that nothing in that house belonged to us. Nothing. 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 Uh, 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 we were merely sojourners in the house of our parents. My, parent, my dad would buy us clothes to wear and shoes to wear. Uh, but the moment we developed enough God to say, my anything. Amen. My anything. My anything. We were swiftly brought to reality with you didn't pay for nothing. Y'all with me? You didn't pay for nothing. The same holds true when we ponder the passages we just read. God says the land is mine, the earth is mine, the heavens are mine, everything in it, the silver, the gold, that's all mine. If we can see how nothing belongs to us, then we can appreciate our next sub point. Content. The antithesis of greed. Content, the antithesis of greed. The result of acknowledging that God owns everything is contentment. How is contentment the result of that acknowledgement? Contentment comes as a result of us knowing God works. Contentment is a discipline. Amen. Contentment is a discipline that is learned and honed through trusting in God's teachings. It starts with the teachings. It's learned and honed through trusting in God's teaching, experiencing his hand move in our lives, and through developing a dependency on him. This thought is best captured from a familiar text that we often go to, which is Philippians 4.13. Go to Philippians 4, uh, 4 for me. Well, you're going to start at verse 10. But to best appreciate the intent, I'm not really trying to move today because I want to make sure we get this all out. The be, but to appreciate the intent of that passage, we have to understand the build up to it. Now, we all say, I can do all things. Slap your leg, stump your feet, shake your head, move that neck. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me or who strengthens me, right? That's, our, that's a go-to passage for a Christian, right? It gives us power. It gives us triumph. But it also gives us dependency. Watch the build up before so that you can appreciate that passage. What does he say in verse 10? First of all, before you learn how to depend on God, you got to see him work. That's why the rejoicing comes. Keep going. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. I, wait, hold on. Remember, we're talking about content, right? Paul says, I'm not saying this out of need. But he's going he's gonna to show you why he's saying, I don't talk to you about this out of a need. Why? Mm hmm I have learned. Y'all hear that? Are you hearing that? 
We have to learn how to be content. But to learn how to be content, you have to first learn how to be thankful or appreciative, which spurs and fuels your rejoice. Give me some more, Kelvin. Uh huh. In whatever. Keep going. Yes, sir. I've learned how to have both a little and how to have a lot. Keep reading. In any and all circumstances, I have learned. Are y'all hearing that? I have learned how to be content. Keep reading. Whether I'm eating, E-A-T-I-N-G, I'm kind of, my stuff broken, but whether I'm eating or what else, or I'm hungry. Translation, whether I'm doing good and I'm eating steaks and filet mignon, and when it comes to that hungry, whether I'm doing top ramen with spam in it. Any and all circumstances. I've been learning. He's been learning. That's what he's telling. What is the encouragement behind that? We need to learn in situations. We need to learn how to be content. We got to learn how to be dependent. We have to learn how to trust. We have to learn how to hone and be focused on God through the midst of our trials. Keep reading. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. If you're really catching what he's saying, he's pretty much reiterating and building on the same thought, whether I'm good or I'm bad. Keep going. I am able. The preparation of what he's been going through has brought him to what he is or where he's going in Philippians 4.13. He's been learning in situations so that he can learn how to depend and rely upon who? Read. All things through him. Him is Christ. Keep reading. Who strengthens me? Y'all see that? Are you seeing this? Contentment is learning. It's honing. And appreciating what God has done. We can see here that Paul builds up to verse 13 by first teaching that contentment was learned through trials and hardships. What got Paul through those times was the realization that it was God that got him through it and not himself. His dependency on God was the fuel behind his motivation. In like fashion, we have to share the same perspective. That is why the Hebrew writer could say in the second clause of verse 5, be content with what you have. Be content. Dependence and trust in God builds contentment. But all of this flows from believing in what God says he can do, he'll do. The second clause flows seamlessly into what ties the first two clauses together and brings us to our third. God got you. I, I love my Ebonics. I'm embracing. God got you. He got you. The third and fourth clauses in verse 5 are, for he has said. Y'all see that? For he has said. Remember when God said, man, I, I can't find nothing else to swear upon. I can't, nothing as great as me. I swear upon myself. For he has said. For he has said, I will never leave you. I won't separate from you, son. I won't separate from you, daughter. Nor forsake you. I won't abandon you, son. If I can, won't separate from you, you know I'm not going to abandon you. I won't leave you nor forsake you. Remember I said that contentment is a discipline that is learned and honed through trusting in God's teachings. First, experiencing his hand in our life. You can't see God's hand move if you don't see or know what he says about it. That's why we have to learn how to read his word and get more in tune with what he says. God's been moving in our lives, but you can't even see him moving because you don't know what he said. Experiencing his hand moving our lives and through developing a dependency on him. Look how he's, he's working steps. When I know what he says about what he's going to do, I start to see it. And when I start to see it, I develop a dependency based on what he said. 
The main component of that discipline is trusting what God teaches. If there is one teaching that we need to fully believe from God, it's what the writer says here in verse 5. I will never, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never. Do you understand the ramifications of that or the implication of that? I will never. He would, he's not going anywhere. The only way you get away from God is if you move. God constantly demonstrates the faithfulness of his word all throughout scripture, especially when it comes to provision and protection. Let's grab a few, a few passages. I told you we're going to do a whole lot. Can you get Luke 12, verse 24 for me? Kelvin, get Genesis 3, 21 and, 9, uh, and, and uh, Pan 9, 3. Brother Payne, can you get Exodus 14, 22? I know we have two verses, but we have to make references so that we can see the teachings of what God says. Does that make sense? You only, we only are going to learn if we see it, if he reiterates it. That's how we learn. Not just from me, I mean, teaching from Hebrews 13, 5, 6. It is teaching from Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 through 6, but it is all, all referenced throughout Scripture. All right? Watch this. Watch Luke 12. Watch Luke 12. 12, 24. Consider the ravens. They don't do nothing. They don't have nowhere to store the stuff that God provides for them. Yet. What? what? Yet what? Yet he what? Y'all see that? If you don't think that God values you more than a raven, are you even being logical? How can you even understand or fathom or even intake what he's teaching if you don't consider yourself more than a raven? Because he says it. Keep reading it. Yeah, go to 25. Yeah, finish that first. And God feeds them. That's where I want it. How much more valuable are you than a bird? No, no, we don't even need 25. That's good right there. Y'all see that? God takes care of ravens. So why wouldn't he take care of us? Proper perspective on money. I'm just, just listen to the build up. Let me get that next passage. Now, that's, that's a food provision. That's a, that's, a, that's a picture of God providing with food. Watch this. Oh. Wow. Keep going. Out of what? Uh-huh. Okay. Now, y'all got to get some context there. Because we tend to think that our blessings are based on what we do. So, so we just saw how God feeds. But that is after the fall when God clothed his man and his woman. Not only does he provide food-wise, he provides clothes. <laughs> Let me get some more. Nah. Go, go ahead. Oh, what was that? Eight? Nine, three? Go to nine, three. Yeah, nine, three. Everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Uh-huh. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. That's enough. Here's another, another demonstration of God providing post-mess up. Post-mess up. That's, after, that's with Noah right there. That's after God wiped the whole world clean. But he provided for Noah the whole time. Noah had food inside the ark, didn't even have to eat. He didn't have to eat, even eat it. Because once they got out, God said, oh, that's yours. God provides food, food, clothing. Can we get the last one? Watch this. 14, Exodus 14, 22. Uh-huh. In the midst of a sea, on dry ground. The water's built up on both sides. Uh-huh. This is a picture of God providing protection. So whether you want to think that you can escape the provision of God and that you control the provision, you don't. 
He, pro he provided food. He provided clothing. He provides protection. The house that we live in, quote unquote, protects us. The clothes that's inside that house, quote unquote, covers us. The food in that refrigerator, quote unquote, feeds you and nourishes you. And all of that provision comes from who God is. We have to have a proper perspective about money. Your job doesn't come from you. You think that you set up that immaculate interview and said everything so perfectly that that person couldn't refuse you? Really? Just think about it. Think about it. Because I'm going to give you another illustration about how God works. Remember when Moses tried to run away from his, what he was supposed to do? He said, I, I, I can't talk that well. Cool. I got your brother for you. God provides in the midst of your circumstance. If you're broke or you're looking for a job, go put in interviews. Go, go fill out applications and trust God to do the rest, not you. Remember, dependence or contentment is learned through dependence on God. But you have to see God work. That's why we have to go to these scriptures. You got to see God work so you can develop that dependence. You have to learn how to trust what he says. What he'll do, he'll do. You with me? Amen. Amen. The beginning, of, the beginning of verse 6 says, so we can confidently say, we often work so hard to control our circumstances. But the reality is that uh, we are extremely limited. Amen. If we are honest, we believe that the person on the other side of the interview table controls if we get a job. The realtor is the one that gets us the best deal for our home. Uh, the sale at the store is the reason why I'm able to go get this clothes, these clothes that I want. The list could go on and on, but we must learn is that God controls every aspect of what he goes on in our lives. God is not a here, here, here's the world, take care of the world, and provide, and I provide for it, and I'm my hands on. No! God is working in the midst of your situation. Our God wants to be part of everything that we do, but he is not going to be somewhere he is not wanted. That is why it is important for us to consult him. It is important for us to consult him, but we, before we start trying to map out our lives. You cannot possibly come up with a five-year plan without tink. How? How do you do that? How do you say, this is where I want to be? Work my hardest. Put, invest so much time. Do everything that I possibly can to, to, to achieve this, this goal or these goals that I have. But I haven't consulted the one who can actually provide that for me? Our prayer lives have to be directly associated with the mindset of God. He says in James, I'll give you whatever you ask if it's according to my will. And a lot of times our wills don't align. And that's why we don't have what we ask for. Because we're still in the mindset that we do the stuff. We don't make this stuff happen, church. We are nothing but pieces. Organic pieces, living pieces, working for the glory of God. That's why. He healthy faith, healthy faith and discernment go hand in hand when it comes to having confidence in God. Healthy faith and discernment go hand in hand when it comes to having confidence in God. Understanding that God is directly involved in our lives and knowing what he can do stems from us believing in what he says. Consider a couple of passages. Ephesians 3, verse 20. Kelvin, Pastor, Brother Payne, please, can you do Malachi 3? And I want to start at verse number 10, but we want to work through that one. If any of this is not making sense, please talk to me. I don't know how much more clear it can be. We have to change our minds and get on God's plan. Our perspective must align 
with the truths of what God says. There's no room for vacillation on that line. Because no matter how you want to slice that pie or that pizza or cake, however you want to, you know, say that thought, no matter how you slice that, God's right. And if we don't believe that, we'll always have the wrong perspective about what he has blessed us with. Let me get that passage, Kelvin. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or what or think. Do you hear that? That's compounded that we're not on his level. Just simply put. We have to learn that. The five-year plan that we think we could come out with is not even close to the box that he's made for us to understand. He says, you, we can't even ponder the thought to even ask him because it's more than all we can think. And then we don't even have the brain space to possibly brainstorm it because it's more than we can imagine. How layered is that? And how nice of a way to say, I'm smarter than you. How much more can he say? I, I'm, I'm smarter than you. So trust me. Right? That's Ephesians 3.20. I, I really hope that you are taking these passages down to help your perspective about the money that, that God has blessed us with. Now watch this one right here because this, this passage doesn't get the appreciation that it should. One is because when we see test, we say, God is crazy. He's contradicting himself because he said you should not put the Lord your God to the test, which is right. But I'm going to teach you something about this passage that I pray will give you uh, uh, more encouragement behind it and more encouragement to trust in God. Now watch this passage. Go ahead, sir. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse. That's not a question. That's a command. Now, watch, watch now, now follow me because I know it's not a New Testament. It don't have to be a New Testament because God doesn't divide his scripture. Scripture is scripture. All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching. Scripture is scripture. Stop dividing old and new. That's not what God did. Sorry, I got mad right there. I'm sorry. Come back. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be what food in my house okay keep going hold on stop right there because that's that's the that's the operative word so God didn't suggest that we bring it full time that was command with that command he gets to this word thereby do you understand what thereby means good there me, thereby means as a result of that. Oh, that's what thereby means. As a result of that. Now, this is as a result. You have to figure out what the that is. Y'all, let me slow it down. As thereby means as a result of that. The that comes from whatever was said before. What was said before, church? Bring the full tithe into my house so that there can be food. Thereby, y'all with me? As a result of that, God is not saying that you test him. Watch what he says. Listen to what he says. Watch this. And thereby, put me to the test. Oh, no, stop right there. Because I see these puzzled faces. He just said, you put me to the test. No, he didn't. This is what he said. I told you to bring in the full tithe. And as a result of you bringing in a, the, listen, as a, as a result of you being obedient, you put me to the test. You're not doing it. I'm telling you what you're about to do. Oh, my goodness. That should have helped y'all bring in the full tithe. He, he just said, your obedience tests God, not your question. Oh, my goodness. That's a high five moment right there. See, the, the problem is that we often question God, and that's how you test him. It doesn't come from your obedience. 
putting God to the test. Look at the passage. Bring the full tithe into my house so that there will be food. Thereby, and, and as a result of what was said before, this is what happens. My obedience puts God to the test, not me questioning God. God, you told me to do this. I'm going to do this. What's up? That's so good. I mean, oh, my goodness. If that doesn't change your, your perspective about money, I don't know what else to tell you. Be obedient and watch God. Why, why, watch what he says he's going to do. Watch what he, say, watch what he says he's going to do. Keep reading, Brother Payne. Put me to the test. Say, hold on. God just told you. He just told you, be obedient and you're going to test me. I'm not mad at that. No, I'm not, I just told you to do it. You got to think logically when you're reading, reading this passage. I just told you to be obedient. That's how you're going to test me. Okay, let's see what's up. That's what, that's what God's saying. Okay, let's see what's up. What, 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 let me tell you what I'm going to do. If I will not. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me work on this. I will not. You ever had somebody uh, uh, tell you that uh, they're better than you in a certain sport? Okay, so, so if I was a ba- not if. When I played basketball, I know I don't look like a basketball player anymore. Don't judge me. When I was pretty good, all right, I was pretty good. I, I, I don't have, I had wobble all around the court. I used to run. All right, so as a basketball player, when somebody says, I'll dog you, if I will not give you 40, that, that's, are you with me? It's the sarcastic. It's like, it's like you talented me? Boy, you don't know what I do to you. Is this making sense? So, like, when, he, when God says, if I will not, it's like, man, you testing me? You don't even know what you're about to get. If you, t- watch, let me tell you what I'm going to do for you. If I will not do what? Open. The, what? If I will not open the window. Where's a window in heaven? <laughs> and, if, and if it's a window in heaven, how big do you think it is? And even if it's, how small do you think it is? If, listen to what he says. If I would not open up a window in heaven, what else? For, for who? Hold on. That's when everybody just said, for me? And broke your neck for me? No. If I would not open up a window in heaven for you, what else? And hold on. If something's getting poured down from heaven, how much do you think that's going to be? And even if it's a little... How little do you think it's going to be? Are, y'all, are you seeing this? This is coming from the God who says, I can do all. Th- I can do more than you can possibly think or imagine. Just think about it. Even his small is, oh, my God. Keep going. Keep going. Uh, oh, my goodness. He, no, 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 no. You ain't saying it with your chest. Say it with your chest. <laughs> Say it with your chest. <laughs> Say it with your chest. A uh, what? Pour down for you. Yeah. A blessing. Blessing. Y'all see that? All right, catch. Here go the catch. Some blessings don't look how you want them to look. It's okay. Because all blessings come from God, right? So even something that doesn't necessarily look good will work out for good. Come on, man, there's scripture for that. I got plenty of Bible for that. Remember that boy Joseph? Remember that? Went to jail. Got lied on. But then went into Egypt. As a, went into Egypt and took over the whole spot. Second in command, but first because of who had put him there. Y'all, are y'all seeing that? So even if, 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 even if it doesn't look like a blessing to you, just know that it's a blessing. Man, remember what, you know what James says? Consider it all joy. Consider it all joy when you go through some stuff. Why? Because it prepares you. Look about, what about First Peter? Gold as refined by fire. But it comes out. Y'all got to understand, we have to learn how to understand. Some blessings prepare us to shine. Why are we not finished? Let let me get some more of that passage. 
pour down for you a blessing. Until there is no more need. Okay. See, this is, why, this is why you have to understand that all blessings don't look like how we want it to look. Because God said, I will pour down, I will open up a window in heaven, pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. But often we, can, we confuse needs with wants. We confuse needs with wants. God is always going to give us what we need. But what you want might not be in his wheelhouse. Well, actually, technically it is in his wheelhouse, but we don't need it. So, but this is what's really crazy about, well, not crazy. This is what's really amazing about God. God is so good at what he does that he gives you more than what you need, which results in some of the stuff that you want. Amen. It's no way. It don't make no sense how I work. And this is not, a, this is how I asked my wife to, I asked my wife to trust me with this. I asked her. I said, baby, don't work. I want to, let me work. And you stay at home and you take care of little man. I, we, I don't trust nobody else with him. So please take care of little man. <sighs> no, I'm a fashion designer. No, I got a, I got a master's. No, I, I got to work, Craig. No, no, no. How can we get to a house? No, <laughs> no. How can we get to a house? <laughs> <laughs> hey, <laughs> no, oh no, this is all fun, so look, look, no, but she went, I'm just messing around, she was like, she said, she said, she said, she said, okay, she said, okay, she was like, all right, we'll try this thing out, now the try wasn't based on me, hey, y'all still missing it, that try wasn't based on me, that try was a result of the growth of her and the confidence in God. So you can't make certain moves unless you believe in God. Because if you don't believe and trust in God to know that he'll do what he's going to say you do, you're actually putting the belief in that person who can't control the situation. But praise God, we don't have to worry about nothing. Food always taken care of. I don't know how we get gas money because that's an extra. I don't understand it. But all I'm saying is, if I'm just talking about my life. But let's, let's, let's look introspectively. Think about what God has done in your life. Based on a budget that you come up with. And we all know we always under budget. We always under budget. But just think about what God has done in your life to give you a healthier perspective about money. The money that God has blessed us with, we do not control. We manage it. All we do is see where checks and balances go. But our trust in him is what gets us through the moment. Oh, man. Malachi is a powerful passage, and I truly hope that you develop an appreciation for it because we often just focus on the tithe aspect and then the test aspect. It's much more than that. I hope you saw it. I got two more sub points. Can we get them? Amen. God bless the people. All right. So this brings us to our next sub point. Two more. God helps, so don't fear. God helps, so don't fear. Fear is the antithesis of trust. So when there is fear, that means that you, we have trust issues. Oh, man. The next three causes are married together. Two are cited from different passages in Psalms, and the result is a rhetorical question. I want to challenge us to think about Psalm 23 as we flesh out this sub point. This is a beautiful passage where God refers to himself as our shepherd. The amount of care and nurturing that goes into a sheep encompasses a lot of patience. Y'all heard that? When dealing with a sheep or with sheep, with a sheep, with sheep, it encompasses a lot of patience. The shepherd knows. Amen. The sheep doesn't know. Everybody say that. The sheep doesn't know. The sheep doesn't know. 
The shepherd knows what's best for the sheep. The shepherd is aware of the dangers. The shepherd is the protector. The shepherd is the provider. And the shepherd is the sole carer and nurturer for that particular flock of sheep. Then what is implied is that the sheep are totally dependent on what the shepherd does. Yeah. The sheep are directly affected by what the shepherd does. If that shepherd is not vigilant, those sheep will die. If the shepherd does not take them to calm waters, the sheep will drown. Let me tell you why. Because rough waters will soak up their fleece. When their fleece gets soaked, it becomes more heavy on them. And they can't or they don't have the strength to get out of rough water. So you got to get broken down. That's why he maketh me lie down. That's why he breaks my leg so I can sit down next to this water. This water that's calm. So that I can have my intake. He leads me. That's the operative word. He leads me. Y'all see that? He leads me through the path of righteousness. Not because of who you are. It's because of for his name's sake. Y'all see that? Dependence is based on God. Oh, that's harsh right there. Because we think it's on us. God is so good to us because of his name, not because of who we are. Y'all see that? The shepherd, the shepherd makes it all happen. Because of the shepherd, the sheep don't have to worry about anything. In like fashion, we must develop the same type of dependency in God. Again, this stems from us learning to trust in his word. If we can wrap our heads around the fact that God is on our side, God is on our side, we would approach life not worried about anything because of all the promises and instances that he has given us throughout scripture. We worry because we are not knowledgeable enough. Yes, I know that hurts. It challenges. It challenges our age. It challenges our our practices. It challenges our our disciplines. It does not matter how old or how young we are. If we put in time and we invest in God, the result, the result is you become more knowledgeable about him. And let me tell you something about knowledge. It does not plateau. It only plateaus based on you. That's why an 80-year-old can, if they want to learn, can learn from a 20-year-old. And that's why a 20-year-old just better listen and be quiet when an 80-year-old is talking. Be respectful. Just You can learn from anybody. Even if it's what not to do. Uh, which brings us to our last sub point and concludes our teaching. Which is, this is the rhetorical question. What can man do? Based on all six of those other sub points, what can man do? Let me help you in on this, what can man do? What can man do? It sounds like, what can man do? <laughs> all right. Listen. I know many of us have been late to work. And I don't know about you, I, 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 it might not show, but being late really does bother me. And I, I'm really working on that, so pray for me. Help me. Because this is really the problem. This is the problem. I'm not late to everything. And this one hurt the most. I'm not late to everything. And it's not that I try to be late. Anybody in their right mind works to respect time. You don't just think that the party starts when you get there. Knock it off. I don't try to be late. But let me tell you how practices vary. When I'm late to work, somebody gets a phone call with an approximate ETA of when I'm going to get there. You know why you do all of that? So everybody say, say why? why? Because you're worried about your job. That's why you do it. 
But when it comes to the time here, we don't do half of that. You know what our response is? At least I'm here. At least I showed up. What can man do? The one who controls my circumstances. The one who, if I don't have this job, can give me another one. The one who can provide for me, even if I don't have a job. For him, at least I showed up. I'm here. But for a man who was put in a position, we show him more respect because we go through all these stages to help secure something that doesn't really belong to us. Even our mindset when we go to work should change because when we go to work, we're not working for the company. We work for God. I work hard, not for Sasco. I love Sasco. That, that's where I'm at. But I don't work hard for Sasco. I work hard because of God who provided this job for me. Has instilled the character of hard work. Because it is biblical that if I don't work, I don't eat. Matter of fact, it's also biblical that you can sit a plate in front of somebody and if they don't bring the spoon or whatever the means of eating to their mouth, they still won't eat. What's the point? Man can't do anything that should have us to fear them. Is that a tough teaching? Absolutely. Because of our mindsets, not God's. Y'all with me? What can man do? Everybody say nothing. Now, if y'all go to work and act crazy and you get laid off, Trust me, that's not God. That's on you. Right? If, if somebody chooses to lay you off, if the, in spite of your perfect attendance, your hard work, uh, your, the extra, woo, the extra time you put in, if you get laid off, off all off of that, that's not on you. That's somebody else. We have to do our part. God, doesn't, God is a principal God. Amen. I knew everybody was going to get quiet on that. Don't let your faith just be like, oh, I'll trust in God. And don't, don't try to do nothing. You can't do that. God does not. He does not. He does not. He does not foster laziness. That contradicts who he is. He put in work, so why won't we? But this is what I'm saying. Man does not control what happens to us, but our God does. So that's even why when stuff goes on in our lives and it looks all bad, that's why we wear a smile. Because we know. We know he's going to do something. I don't know what he's going to do, but he's going to do something. I remember Dr. Raymond Carr said this. He said he's, pre he's predictably unpredictable. Let that sit for a minute. You don't have to worry about how, what's going to happen. You know something's going to happen. How it's going to happen, that's a whole other question. Lesson is yours. <laughs> if you're here, stand to your feet, stand to your feet. If you're here, if you're here, and you haven't had a healthy perspective on the blessings that God has given you, you can repent for that. You can repent of that. Or maybe you have. Or maybe you have had a healthy perspective. But there are, also, there are other things that's going on, in your, going on in your life. You can ask a prayer in church to pray on your, on your behalf. But maybe you haven't even got access to God. And you want to meet up with him in the water of your grave of baptism. All you have to do is say this with me. I believe Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. That confession brought him death for a moment. But for us, it'll give us eternal life. Whatever you need to do, I encourage you to do as we stand together and sing.